Okay, all priests, raise your hand. All priests, raise your hand. So, you can tell who wasn't at my last workshop. So. Whatever. All right. Should we pray? Great, let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> I just invite you to quiet yourself for a moment. As I try to begin all, all talks, um, graced, graced moments happen when the presenter is prayed and when the people receiving have prayed. So it's not merely the responsibility of me, but we come together and we ask that God would bless us and show us. Heavenly Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit would be in our midst, be present to us. That our hearts and our minds would be open to you. We make this prayer in your name, Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Good. So, all priests, raise your hand. Prophets. Good. We're getting the hang of it. So, um, so what, what we're going to talk a little bit about this afternoon is penance, but specifically from kind of the perspective of St. Francis. So this uh, January, I released a new film called The Sign of Contradiction. Just curious, who's seen that film so far? Great. Both of you. That's awesome. <laughs> no, um, it, I just was in Detroit last Thursday night and just r really had a wonderful time with the screening of the film. And one of the lines of St. Francis is, perfect joy is when you go to a friary, you knock on the door, and they send you away, and you have to walk away. And that's perfect joy for the friary, for the friar. Um, yeah, although I've experienced what is perfect joy recently, I, I took the film to the friars, to our elderly friars, and most of them are in their late 80s, early 90s, and we showed the film in the middle of the afternoon. So perfect joy is showing a film that you've worked on for two years to a group of brothers and half of them sleep through the whole thing. <laughs> that is perfect joy. Although one of the friars told me, don't worry, Dave, they sleep during lunch too. It's like, all right, that's, that's, I'd appreciate that. So what I did is I did a film called Sign of Contradiction. If you go to, the, to my Wild Goose website, you can get information about it. We should probably have it on the university website too. We will in a week, let me put it that way, all right? But really, so uh, some of the genesis of this, uh, Pope Francis uh, steps out on the stage and w smoke comes up, Obamus Papa, we have a Pope, and he comes up and through the interpreter we hear his name is Francesco. And myself and the other brothers that I'm with were like, Francis? That's like, knowing that he was a Jesuit, we figured Francis Xavier, and then he becomes aware very quickly that it was, in fact, not Francis Xavier, but it was Francis of Assisi. Before he, he went um, out, once he was elected, somebody said to him, Francis, rem or, uh, uh, George, remember the poor? All right, remember the poor? Uh, and he chases, takes the name Francis. So I begin to ask myself, why at this time? You know, it's never happened before 800 years. It's never ha happened before. Why now? Why might it be that he takes the name Francis? Around the same time, I'd taken a group to Assisi, and I take uh, groups to Assisi all the time, and what I hear all the time is something similar, and it is something to the effect of, Francis is so much more than I expected. Right? We have this idea of who St. Francis is, but he's so much more than that, and I suggest whatever that is, however you see Francis, that he's more than that. Somebody said to me one time, Francis is more than a birdbath. Yes, 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 he is, right? And as we were making this film, uh, I was, we were out to, actually in Assisi out to dinner, and the waiter who was taking care of us, uh, I had asked him, I said, you know, why are you in Assisi? He was from Ukraine. And he said, I love Francis. And he goes through this big thing about how he loves Francis. But then at the end of his little explanation, he said, but I'm, but I'm not into Jesus. That whole Jesus thing, that whole Christ, that whole Catholic thing, I'm not into that at all. 
which is really the reason we made the film, is if you think you understand who Francis is, exactly. <laughs> Thank you very much. But don't know Jesus, then we don't know who Francis is. I mean, what animated Francis, and, and Contra, Father Contra Mesa is a part of the film, and he says that somebody asked him one time, what's more important to you, Francis or Jesus? And, and Contra Mesa says, you've got to be kidding me. Francis is nothing without Jesus. So what our desire in the film was to be able to, through the lens of Francis, to be able to encounter Jesus. Amen? And one of the main ways that Francis did this, in encountering Jesus, by, was by living penance. So this is supposed to be a workshop, which means I'm supposed to answer, ask you guys questions, and you're supposed to answer, and we're supposed to have dialogue. Amen? <laughs> so when you hear the word penance, what do you hear? I mean, what do you think of when you hear the word penance? Okay, somebody raise your hand. Come on, come on. Yeah, yeah. Sacrifice, Sacrifice all right. Confession? Redemption? Redemption. Sin? Sin. Giving, up. Giving up something, all right. Changing? Changing. Fasting? Fasting? Prayer? Prayer? This is an overachieving group, I might add. Yeah, yeah. What's that? Reparation. Reparation? Great, great. All of that's true, okay? But we really want to be able to take a look at what this idea of penance meant to Francis and what does it mean that Francis says live penance and what that might look like for us. Because one of the things we wrestled with as we're making the film is we don't merely want, okay, that was nice, somebody go, they enjoy it, but that it actually impacts and brings about change or brings about penance in our life. And it causes us and invites us to have a different understanding of what, what is penance or what is the traditional understanding of penance. The beginning of the scriptures, uh, Jesus comes onto the scene and the first thing he says is um, repent. The word he uses metnoia, metnoia, the kingdom of God is at hand. This idea of metanoia is a really, really rich word. Uh, it means, honestly, all the things you just said. Really, if we were to put together all of the things you just said, that's kind of what metanoia means. It means repent, and that's the way it's translated in most versions. Uh, it means, the, actually, the Greek is to change. So Jesus is saying, change, the kingdom of God is at hand. It means conversion. In fact, probably the better understanding or the way we would understand penance would be conversion. Jesus saying, be converted, the kingdom of God is at hand. This idea of metanoia is actually the main charism of my Franciscan community. So Francis started three Franciscan communities. I like to say it took him three times to get it right. So he tore it three, and we are the third order regular. And metanoia is this main charism of my particular community. It is also the follow-up. I've done a a follow-up video series to the Wild Goose, and the, this new series is called Metanoia, uh, inviting us to look and to reflect about what does it look like for us to be converted? What does it look like for us to be able to experience conversion? So when in the scriptures, in, in Francis's understanding of penance would be more of the scriptural understanding, and that is one of metanoia, change, conversion, to turn, to move, okay? So in, in the earliest understanding, it was a question of the heart. So this idea of metanoia was of the heart. So the heart needs to return or the heart needs to change. In the fourth century, we begin to see kind of a shift of the understanding of penance. Penance becomes a less of an internal reality and more of an external reality. And the reality is, for most people, except for this overachieving group, penance is largely an external experience. You go to confession, you're given a penance, you do something, and you're done with it, right? It has a beginning and an end. That would not have been Francis's understanding of penance. Francis would understand penance not as a beginning and end, but rather as a way of living. It's a way we go about life. But in the fourth century, we're moving away from external pra internal practices, this conversion of the heart, to external practices. Penance becomes some of the things you talked about. Fasting, offering up, sacrifice, hair shirts, those things that we understand traditionally as being penitential. We also begin to see a change in the nature of confession. Whereas before, confessions were much more public. If we pay attention to scriptures, it says, confess your sins in a community. So everybody would just kind of stand up and confess their sins. We'd be welcome to do that now if anybody would. 
So obviously what, what we find is, is that people are less and less likely to do that and now confession becomes more internal is we begin to have the process of confessing to a priest in the intimate personal experiences. And because of that, the nature of sin and penance becomes largely between a penitent and a priest. All right, so there's not this sense of public experience. So roughly in the 6th and the 7th century, you begin to develop what is this desire to have a deeper understanding of what is it to live penance or what is it to have be a part of penance. And you begin to have what's called the order of penitents. And what the order of penitents were was a group of men and women who were fairly notorious sinners. <clears throat> so they had committed some sin that the, the local community would know about. Murder, adultery, theft, the, something like that. So it was a fairly public and it was a fairly serious sin. So if somebody did a type of sin like that, they would have to become part of the order of penance or a penitent. And that would be a process, in some ways, kind of like our RCIA. All right, somebody enters into the order of penitents, and you're a part of that community for, could be a number of years, depending on your sin. So you'd go to confession, you'd go to the priest, you'd say, okay, this is what you have to do. You have to be a penitent, uh, and that would go for however long was determined. So an order of penitents became a group of people. And this would be where Francis would have his first encounter with the penitents. Francis would uh, begin to experiencing his conversion. He, he goes off, he wants to be a knight, he goes off to war, uh, gets captured. This process, he was in jail for a year, he was a POW for a year, beginning to ask the question, what's life about? What is the purpose and meaning of life? And this begins, in one way, the beginning of Francis's conversion. He encounters in Assisi a group called the Penitents of Assisi. All right, and these were men and women who were living penance. They were, they would dress differently. They would be uh, dressed in simple clothing. They would live a structure in their life. They would have a structure of prayer. They would have a structure of service. Uh, and they would live on the outskirts of Assisi. Francis would become a part of this group. And as a side note, this would be where my community comes from. Francis starts the first order, and this is just by way of clarification. Francis starts the first order, the order of the Friars Minor, the Brothers of the Friars Minor, uh, and they're doing preaching, they're going around to the various places. He starts the second order with the Poor Clares, and then they understand fairly quickly that there needs to be a community that is not going to be mendicant, that's not always going one place to another, but somebody that would stay in the parishes, in the schools, in the health facilities, and that's where my community comes from. So what Francis does is he goes back to this order of penitents, these group of people, these men and women that he had spent time with before he started his Franciscan community, which was really, in many ways, Francis never had this idea of starting a community, but the church asks it of him. So he goes back to the order of penitents and he starts my community. So the whole name of my community is Franciscan Friars of the Third Order Regular of St. Francis of Penance. So that we see our, rela our, our origins in this relationship with Francis that he had actually before he started the OFM. So we like to say, A, Francis took him three times to get it right, and he went back to the brothers and sisters that he had a relationship with at the beginning. So this idea of penance uh, is something that Francis understood well. When he begins his conversion, if you take a look at what's called the Testament, Francis says, um, then I began to do penance. And this was at the beginning of his conversion. And again, Francis's idea and understanding of conversion was, of penance was this, this metanoia, this conversion. Amen? Amen? I believe that the church would do well to begin to adopt, once again, this idea of penitence. Is, is that we live as men and women uh, embracing the idea of living a life of penance. So one of the things that we've developed from the film is live penance. And it's kind of a, if you go to the website, you're able to see, actually you're able to see all the things that we're going to talk about. This idea of penance being not something that has a beginning and an end, but penance is a way that we approach God. Penance is the way we approach our relationship with our brothers and sisters. Penance is the way that we do all that we do as, as spiritual beings. Amen? I was here at the university a number of years ago. And there were a couple of students, and they were freshmen, and I had said to them, my hope for you while you're here is that you experience conversion. And they're like, they nod, and they say, okay, that's fine, and they walk out of my office, and I would hear later that they were frustrated with me. And they were mad at me, but it's like, what does Father Dave think? Like, we're not converted? I mean, we're converted. 
So they were frustrated with this idea that they would experience conversion. But I want to suggest that conversion is necessary for all of us. If we ever find ourselves at this place that says, I am fully converted, we should probably be a little bit worried. Amen? And yet again, in the same way of penance, we understand this conversion as an event, as a singular event. We use language like they were converted, and that conversion becomes, they either became Catholic or some other Protestant would say they were converted. And so I want to, it needs to be clear in our mind, to understand what we're talking about is a process. It's a journey. We're never finished, right? This lifelong process of conversion is what the gospel invites each one of us to. And we see this in St. Francis. Amen? So there are five characteristics that Francis would speak of in his testament about what does it look like to live penance. And we're going to take a look at those. Number one, love of God. At the heart of everything that Francis did, it is all rooted in the reality uh, that God loves and that we love God. And Francis, when, when we take a look at the scriptures, he, he believes that he's called to be a knight, that that's where he's going to find glory, a wonderful life by power, prestige, recognition. This is what Francis desired more than anything, that everybody would cheer when Francis is around. So he thought he'd go off to war and he'd come back and everybody would be excited. Yay, Francis. And Francis is the life of the party, excited. Everybody wants to be around Francis. Francis pays for everything. Whenever there's a party, Francis pays for it. His dad's money, which is convenient, right? So Francis is, but then he begins to having this conversion, and there's, when you take a look at his life, there are multiple encounters and experiences, but there's one particular experience when he's down uh, in the lower level, if you know where the, if you, who's been to Assisi? All right, next year, let's do this in Assisi, amen? Yay, all right, may it be so. So Francis is down there, and he goes to the liturgy, and he hears the scripture, um, if you want to follow me. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, follow me. Sell all that you have and give it to the poor. Francis hears this, and he says, this is what I long for. This is what I've been looking for with all of my heart. So Francis begins to understand that this is, in fact, what the Lord is calling him to. So from the beginning of this, pro or this part of this process of this journey was the reality that God was calling him to something. That God wasn't just this vague power out there, but that God wanted to be in relationship with him, and God was asking something of him. So each one of us needs to be able to reconcile that fundamental reality that we have a God who is asking something of us, that he wants to be in relationship. Francis, at the very end of his life, says, God has shown me what is mine to do. May he now show you what is yours to do. The question we have to ask ourselves is, do we know what God is asking of us? If you were to write on a piece of paper, this is what God is asking of me. And if you don't have an answer to that, we need to find an answer to that. Amen? Living penance at the heart of that answer is loving God. Loving God with all that we are. And Francis would do this in, in obviously, understanding that we have a triune God. That he would come to understand that God was his father. Now, we know, that, I guess, as many of us know the story, that Francis was ultimately separated from his earthly father for lots of reasons. He had taken a bunch of his father's property, sold it, gave it to the poor. His dad didn't appreciate that. So there's this rift that exists between Francis and his father that, as far as we know, never got reconciled. And there's something beautiful and something difficult about that. I think some people feel like, well, my, my family life is such a mess, there's no way that God could call me to be a saint, right? Because it's such a mess. Well, Francis's family life was a mess. And yet, there's a beautiful image of Francis, maybe not so beautiful, stripping naked, right? Outside of the square, the cathedral. And he throws his, his clothes down to his father, at his father's feet, and he says, you are no longer my earthly father, but I have one father, and is a father in heaven. And this is a change that takes place of Francis, and it's at the heart of loving God, and that is a detachment for the things of the world. To the degree that we're able to love God, he has to become our everything. Amen? So Francis, in this image of being naked, the, the bishop takes his cloak and wraps it around Francis. And Francis is, the church is now going to look over, the church is now going to protect Francis. Francis will ultimately be able to say, and this is one of the texts that, that I find beautiful and also unbelievably challenging. Francis says, oh God, you are enough for me. Oh God, you are enough for me. I find it interesting that Francis didn't say, God, you're everything. But I, my guess is we've probably met people who have everything, and it's not enough. And we meet people who have nothing, and God is in the center of their life, and it's enough. 
For Francis, God becomes enough. A famous scene of Francis in the evening, one of the friars is outside of his door listening to how Francis prays. And all night, all he said was, my God and my all. My God and my all. The invitation for us in beginning to live penance is to ask ourselves, is that our reality? Is God our everything? Um, it was mentioned last night by Chris that I walked the Camino. I walked 500 miles in order to just thank the Lord for being a priest. But the very first night, the prayer that I made was a really simple prayer and also a very foolish prayer. And I said, God, I give you permission to do whatever you want to make me holy. Do not pray like that, right? Because he hears those kind of prayers. Like when we pray for him to fix something, it's like, well, you're going to deal with this a little longer, right? This is at the heart of the Franciscan spiritual life. The heart of Francis is that being detached from whatever keeps me away from Jesus. That's a scary prayer. Jesus, take away. Allow me to be detached from whatever keeps me away from. But this is what Francis's prayer is. He has an encounter with a father where the father becomes his, where God becomes his father. But he also has an encounter with Christ. For Francis, the greatest feast is Christmas. Amen? Amen. We should have Christmas every day. Amen? Amen. Really? Yeah. Here's that. For Francis, he could not imagine that God would take flesh. This just was, this blows his mind that the almighty, omnipotent, all holy, all great God would become a baby. We, baby, cue baby crying. Baby's not crying anymore. Of course not, right? Francis couldn't imagine this. So we have the beginning of the crest scenes and the nativity scenes. It's Francis who started this. He goes to a little village about an hour away from Assisi called Greccio. And he has this image. He has this desire to be able, if people could see what God has done, they would be converted. If we could see what God has done, so he, he creates this image with, with the animals and the nativity scene. And somebody that night had this image of, of Jesus, the baby Jesus being asleep. And everybody was trying to wake him up, trying to wake him up. And nobody could wake him up. So in this image, Francis goes and he takes the baby Jesus and the baby awakens. This becomes Francis's ministry. He is going to awaken in our heart the person of Jesus. For Francis, Christmas is the feast because it is profoundly, uh, profoundly personal that God would take on flesh. That God would, as we hear in the Philippians, God would empty himself and become one of us. Then we'll talk about this in the last element of, of penance, but this idea of emptying ourselves, this detachment, is at the heart of what does it look like for us to live penance. Amen? So Francis encounters the father, and Francis encounters the son. And then ultimately Francis would say, the friar, should want, the friar should desire one thing alone, the spirit of God at work in him. So Francis encounters God as father, he encounters God as son in the person of Jesus, and he encounters the spirit which animates, which begins to animate and make everything that we're going to talk about alive for us. Francis, if you look at his story, all of the major events in his life are begun and concluded by an encounter with the Spirit of God. So he's not able to do anything without him. Amen? Amen. So we ask ourselves, just take a moment and quiet yourself. Who is God for us? What is the image we have of God? What is the image we have of God that's not true? In order for us to be able to live a life of penance, we do it in relationship with God. And there must be this transformation that takes place, that our image of God becomes a God who is our Father, a God who has reconciled the world to us in the person of Jesus, and the Spirit which animates this. And this must become our everything. It must be in the center of our life. Amen? Amen? Number two, first one, love of God. Number two, love of neighbor. To live a life of penance. So for Francis, the group of people that bothered him the most were the lepers. Because they represented everything that Francis hated and everything, nothing that he wanted. So lepers had no power. They had no influence. They had no respect. They had no authority. The lepers would live in the, so Assisi's kind of up on a hill. The lepers would live down in the valley, and Francis would never go there. Scripture, uh, France, or the Testament says that Francis was repulsed by the lepers. 
So he's praying one day, and he hears the Lord say to him, I can make that which is bitter sweet. Okay, I can make that which is bitter sweet. And Francis knew exactly what that was. So the story of Francis walking through the valley, and he's, he's coming upon a leper, and everything about him wanted to go the other direction, and he embraces the leper. And he encounters Christ in that. And he spends the rest of his living days with the lepers. Because God made that which was bitter sweet. People talk about Francis in his joy, in his peace, and all of that. And they say, what was it? I want to suggest that this was at the heart of that. Imagine for a moment there was nothing in your life that was bitter. And that all was sweet. And do you believe in a God that can make that which is bitter sweet? So part of this love of neighbor that we have to ask ourselves is, who is that leper for us? Because everybody has a leper. And if you don't, you need to pray and figure out who it is, if you don't know who it is. Because we live in a world that's becoming more and more polarized, and the leper is basically those people. You know, those people. And one of the things that I've really appreciated about Pope Francis is he's continually reminding us about those people on the outside. And he reminds us that everybody is invited to Christ. Amen? Amen. Who's invited? Everybody. So if everybody is not invited, that means some people aren't invited. And if some people aren't invited, it's possible that I'm not invited. Everybody is invited to relationship with Christ. And Francis understood this. And in that, that which was bitter became sweet. So who's your leper? I remember when I was in charge of the seminarians, Jesus, the, the gospel was, um, love your enemy. And I preached a little bit about that. And, and then I found myself thinking about my enemy, because I had just given this home. It's like, you know, do I really know what that looks like? And, and I thought, it's like, well, I, I don't have any enemies. And then I began to think more about my enemy, my leper. And then what came to my mind and my heart was Cecilia Richards. And she is the head of Planned Parenthood. And I made my, my mind at that moment that I was going to pray for her. Not just pray for her, but really pray for her. So I stalked her a little bit, found out about her family, found out that she had kids, found her address. And I start to send her Christmas cards and Easter cards, said, hi, I'm Father Dave Pavanka. You don't know me, but I pray for you. And I would say, she never responded. I don't know if she ever got it, actually. I, I don't know how they go through her mail. She had a couple girls. And I prayed, I told her one time that I'm praying that her kids are healthy, that they do well in school. Somewhere in this process of praying for her, she moved from being my enemy to a lot like my sister and that my sister's got kids that she wants the best for her kids. Well, she became a person for me, actually. She wasn't an enemy. She wasn't a leper. She was a person a lot like a lot of people that I knew. Now, I abhor what she does and what she participates in and the organization that she runs, what they stand for. But in this praying for her, she became real to me. You see, one of the things I love about Pope Francis, he said that, that oftentimes we, we, we build this wall between other people, whoever they are. And Pope Francis says we need to tear down the wall. And he says, and when we do that, what we see is we see people's faces. And we see their stories. And we realize that they're not terribly different than us. This is the challenge. This is a challenge for us, right? Who is that leper for us? That person that God is inviting us to live? Because I believe that that's a, a, tr a crazy, wonderful miracle when God can take this, this anger, this hatred, this frustration we have towards this person or this group of people and make that sweet. And yet it's the invitation, it's the challenge for us, right? That we are supposed to love the way that he's loved us. So who is that, that, that leper for us? St. Francis would also raise the question that for some, the leper is ourself. 
It's that there's parts of us. He would say, no one is to be called enemy. All are benefactors, and no one does harm. You have no enemy except yourself. And that there's the part of us that, that we need to invite the Lord to make that sweet. You know, I was in Detroit recently, and somebody said, this lady said to me, she said, Father, uh, I can't think about something I did. It's 30 years ago. I was 18 years old, and I can't stop thinking about that. It was bitter. I mean, she, whenever she thought about her past, it was bitter. It was hardened. It was, the Lord needs to be able to make that sweet. So this leper for us is, is not only those people, right? But sometimes it's us. One of the things that St. That Francis said that was one of my favorite lines, he said, what we are before God is what we are in nothing else, right? What we are before God is what, this, this image of us standing before the Lord, literally naked, just standing there naked and allowing the Lord to see us, and that is who we are. And that's not an apology. We don't apologize for that, right? That, that we celebrate that. The reality is that we stand before God without all these, these images or who we think we are or what we want people to see us like, but we just stand before the Lord and we can just be there who we are and celebrate that. Amen? So this, this loving of the neighbor and the loving of ourself needs to be able to reconcile the flesh, which is opposed to ourself, right? So the scriptures speak of the flesh, Galatians 5, the fruits of the spirit compared to the fruits of the flesh. The flesh is anger, impatience, lust, drunkenness, that, right? To be able to reconcile that and allow the Lord to root that out of our life. So as, to, so as our ability to be able to love ourselves. Jesus says in the scripture, love your neighbor as yourself. We've all heard that before, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. The problem is, is I think we do that, right? We don't love ourselves very well. We're critical of ourselves. We're hard on ourselves. We don't give ourselves a break. We're not merciful to ourselves. So we love our neighbor as ourselves. I want to suggest that's not exactly what he meant, right? Right? I love Gregory the Great said that if we were able to see ourselves the way God sees us, we would be tempted to bow down and worship. So this desire or this, this ability to love our neighbor, to love that leper, and that leper is often ourself. So to be able to allow the Lord to reveal to us our goodness, our beauty, and then be able to embrace that. Amen? Amen. Number one, love God. Say that. God. Number two, love our neighbor. Love our neighbor. Number three, uh, hatred of sin. We'll get back to that one. So Francis is uh, up in the caves. So if you're in Assisi, you would go to the courtries to these caves that were up in the hill. And then Francis is praying up there, and he, we don't know exactly what this looked like, but he saw his sin. And this changed Francis. You see, for Francis, Francis wanted to be in the center of his life. And what he realized was that he needed to move away from the center and put the Lord in the center of his life. For Francis, sin was ignoring God, ignoring the one who wanted to be in the center and putting himself in the center. One of our friars was at a doctor's office one time. And he was in line and he's literally standing three feet from the receptionist. And the receptionist looked at him, didn't recognize him, didn't say hello, didn't say welcome, and just started back to her work looked up at him, did not greet him, went back to his work. He felt profoundly ignored, right? He came back afterwards and he said, I think that's what Francis was talking about with sin, is that God is standing in front of us and we're ignoring him. It's interesting to be in Rome. Uh, I've had the opportunity to go to Rome several times. And you would think being in Rome is the best place to be a priest, and that's not necessarily true. It's a great place to be a friar, so when I'm in my habit, everybody loves friars, all right? Not necessarily everybody loves priests, because particularly in Rome, you have uh, 2,000 years of priests not always doing the greatest things. At an occasion one time, I was dressed in my clerics. I was flying home, so I was dressed with a collar and all that. Busy coffee counter. Uh, the guy taking everybody's order, this order, this order, this order, skipped me, this order. This went on for... 15 minutes, and I'm just, all I want is a cup of coffee. The guy making the coffee finally recognized what was going on, and he said, Father, what would you like? I said, just want a cappuccino. He said, okay. I do that to God all the time, right? God is in the center in front of me, and I ignore him. I don't see him. I don't give him time. 
I don't recognize him. This for Francis was sin. Moving God away from the center of our life and putting something else there. Whatever that is, whatever that looks like for you, putting something else there. But what moved Francis to conversion was the experience that he had in this cave of a deep understanding of the, of the sinfulness, of his sinfulness, but understanding deeper than that was God's love. Francis came out of this cave changed because he encountered a God who loved him in the midst of his sin. But what it called him to, what penance calls us to, is a, di is a desire to change, right? So I, I um, put up a thing on Instagram a couple of months ago where it, it was the encounter between Jesus and the, and the woman who was caught in the act of the adultery. And Jesus said, uh, I, I do not condemn you, right? So I just put it that. I said, Jesus doesn't condemn us. Now, I appreciate people's uh, exuberance, but I had many people who were frustrated with me because I didn't mention that Jesus said, go and sin no more. I am well aware that Jesus said, go and sin no more. Amen? But he also, what, what, what changed her was that she wasn't condemned, right? So until we experience a God who loves us and doesn't condemn us, we don't have the grace to go and sin no more. We first encounter a God who doesn't condemn us. And this is what changed Francis, was he recognized his sin and realized that God loved him more, and because of that, then he desired to root out his sin. So we have to pray, brothers and sisters, for in hatred towards sin, not, not because of itself, because the reality is everybody here has sinned. Amen? Anybody who's not sinned? Good. I thought you were raising your hand, Emily. You, you, no, you're just scratching. I see you're just scratching. I thought for a second it was going to go up. I said, this is great. And this is important for us to recognize is that we've all sinned. Ultimately, sin does not keep us out of heaven, right? Heaven is full of people who have sinned, right? Every one of them. It's one of the few things that all the saints have in common is they were all sinners, except for the Blessed Mother. Always throws a curve. Qualify that. Right? What keeps us out of heaven is failure to repent for sin, failure to recognize sin, failure to go before the Lord and say, Lord, show me my sin so that I don't live in it. Because the reality is, is if we live in our sin, we're going to die in our sin. And if we die in our sin, our salvation is in jeopardy. So the nature of sin is that God in his mercy reveals us and shows us our sins so that we can be converted. So it's the third element. This, this element of living in penance is to continually go before the Lord and ask him to show us our sin. Amen? Amen. Number one, love God. Number two, love neighbor. Number three, uh, hatred of sin. Number four, uh, participation in the sacraments. Particularly the Eucharist. So again, for, for St. Francis, this, this idea that God takes on flesh, that he empties himself and he becomes one of us, so we would have the nativity scene. But the early nativity scenes would have a crib underneath the altar, but the baby Jesus wouldn't be there, right? And the reason being is Francis understood that every time we celebrated Mass, that Christ was going to occupy that crib once again, right? Francis, again... The, the Father Contralmesa speaks in the film that one of the unique elements that Francis brings is to invite us to reflect on the humility of God. And he said that God would humble himself and become a baby, which is remarkable. If you think about that, God, the almighty, omnipotent God, is now needy, needy, needs to be changed, needs to be fed, right? This, this humility that there is in that. Francis would go on to say, take that same God who becomes one of us and allows himself to be crucified. Just the abject humiliation that there is in that. Stripped naked. We, we put a cover over Jesus so that it's more, more acceptable to our eyes. Jesus literally stripped naked above a group of people, nailed to a cross for all of the world to goff and laugh, all right? Francis, this is unbelievable that God would humble himself and be crucified. And then the final for that would be Francis, that God would humble himself in Eucharist. That he would come to us in what looks to be bread and that he would become so profoundly vulnerable that I can take this host which has been transformed into the body of Jesus and I could do whatever I want to that. 
for Francis, this is, this, this is more than he could imagine. So to be able to receive that, to be able to become that what we eat, right? To be able to consume that who we worship. Actually, this morning I wasn't able to be here because uh, one of my very good friends and, and uh, two of my friends celebrated their 25th anniversary of vows. So I was able to preach for their celebration of, of their anniversary. One of the sisters, Sister Faustina, did this, um, uh, what is it, the ancestry thing where you figure out what, so she found she's like German and Italian and all this kind of thing. And then it came back, the test came back, she was 1% Jewish. And she was like, she never thought she was 1% Jewish. And I said, oh, that's interesting. And she says, do you know why I'm 1% Jewish? I said, no, I don't. And she goes, because I receive Eucharist every day. <laughs> right? Right? Who am I to argue with sister, right? But there's something really beautiful about that, right? She receives the Lord every day, and she's just slowly becoming more Jewish, all right? <laughs> so Francis, Francis understood this, this, this reception of Jesus in the Eucharist, but then also the reception of the sacrament of, con of um, confession, to be able to go and humble ourselves before another person uh, and to be able to hear those words, God the Father of mercy, this, this, this reconciliation that takes place. So, uh, con consistent, frequent participation in the sacraments. Amen? Amen? Living penance. Number one, love of God. Number two, love of neighbor. Number three, hatred of sin. Number four, uh, frequent participation in the sacraments. And the last that Francis would speak of, and it would be what he would call uh, worthy fruits of penance. And these are the things that we might normally think about. Fasting. Uh, for Francis, obviously, and he would later in his life, he would actually repent for teaching, for treating his body so diff so hard, that he would think that realized, he would come to realize that maybe he was too hard on his body. But when we pay attention to the scriptures, Jesus says, "If you want to follow me, we have to answer that question. Okay, yes, I do. Okay, if you want to follow me, deny yourself. It is constitutive to the gospel." Fasting, self-denial has got to be a part of our life. Again, if you want to follow me, yes, Jesus, I want to follow me, deny yourself. What does that look like for you? There was a day, some of you are old enough to remember this, where no Catholics ate meat on Friday, right? And we were distinguished because of that. I'm concerned that there is nothing that distinguishes us from anybody else anymore, right? If you want to deny, if you want to follow me, deny yourself. We... That is a commandment. It wasn't a suggestion. And I want to just real briefly, there's a connection between our ability to deny ourselves and our ability to pick up our cross. If you want to follow me, deny yourself and pick up your cross. Daily, he says. If we have a hard time embracing suffering, which we do, if we have a hard time embracing our cross, which we do, I want to suggest that part of the reason is because we can't deny ourselves. We live in a world that says get as much as you can get and get it while the getting's good. So you can go to Circle K or 7-Eleven or Sheets or whatever that store is that you have, Wawa or whatever, and you can buy a soda that's 7,500 ounces, right? <laughs> Seriously, who needs that, right? You can go to McDonald's and you can supersize it, right? We live, get and get as much as you can get. We have to live a life of self-denial, and it's a part of the penitential life, as, as some of you know. Fasting has been something that's been a part of my life and a part of my spiritual life since I was a kid. It was something that we did as a family, but particularly around Easter, I mean around the Holy Week. So one of the things I did, I started a number of years ago, I, I called it my birthday fast. So I fast from something, abstain from something from my birthday to my birthday. So for one year, I give up something. The first year I did this was alcohol. It's not a big deal, but I like to have a glass of wine every now and then, a beer, something like that, amen? A little bit of scotch every now and then. It's good for the heart. Amen? <laughs> All right, just putting that out there. It was also this, this year was also the first time I went to Italy. So I'm with the friars, and, and we're, our mother house is overlooking the Roman Forum, and they come out with cheese and sausages and hard breads and nice glasses and red wine. And I said, no, thank you, I'm fasting. And they said, you don't fast from wine, right? <laughs> My next stop was Germany. <laughs> a bratwurst with a Diet Coke is not, is not a good mix, right? Okay, I, seriously, I don't care what you do, but a life of self-denial has got to be a part of the Catholic Christian life. 
So I invite you to think and reflect about that. What does that look like for you to deny yourself? And the danger is that we only, we only look at food. There are lots of ways that we can deny ourselves that have nothing to do with food. What I'm about to say is crazy talk, but I'm going to go ahead and put it out there. You're in the grocery store, get in the longest line. I know, crazy talk, <laughs> right? Stay in the slow lane on the highway. Park 30 feet further away. Take the stairs. What are simple, get up 15 minutes early. What are simple little things we can do that can begin to deny ourselves? Not merely for the self of denying, but to be able to say yes to Jesus. The reason we deny ourselves, I'm saying no to this so I can say yes to that. And that is Jesus. Amen? So if we're going to live a life of dependence, there needs to be some sense of self-denial to that. There needs to be a reaching out to people less fortunate than ourselves. Doesn't matter to me how you do it. Doesn't matter to me where you do it. But our world has got to be bigger than us, right? St. Francis would say, sanctify yourself and you'll sanctify society. That we need to be that yeast, that leaven out there in the world. To be able to take a look at an area that we can do, an, an area that we can have influence in. A good buddy of mine's an attorney up in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And one of the things he's done for years, I don't know if he still does it, he's done it for years, it's called, uh, they have Hot Dog Tuesday. And they go down to the park and all they do is they give hot dogs and chips to the, to the local people that are less fortunate, that are homeless. That's all they do. What does it cost to buy several dozen hot dogs, right? They've done this for years, just reaching out to them, spending time with them. There are people in your community that need us, need you to reach out to them. It has got to be a part of the Christian life. Living penance is reaching out to those people that are less fortunate than ourselves. Amen? Amen. It's prayer. That, that if we're going to be faithful to this life of penance, we need to be able to pray. Again, I'm, I don't care how you pray. I don't care what it looks like. But if you aren't praying every day, if that's not a part of your life, how are we being converted? How are we drawing closer to Jesus? How are we experiencing change in our life unless we're making ourselves available and present to Jesus? So unless, and again, it doesn't matter to me what it looks like, it doesn't matter how you pray, it doesn't matter where, you, all that matters to me is that you're praying. If we're gonna live this life of penance and a life of conversion, we need to live a life of prayer. I grew up with a mom and dad who modeled that for me. I would love to have a dollar. My mom's got MS, but so she couldn't feel the beads on a small rosary. So she used this rosary that you like hang up on a wall, right? I'd love to have a dollar for every time I walk into her room and she was sitting on a bed with a rosary draped over her lap praying a rosary, right? She didn't do it so that I would see her. She did it and I saw her. What does it look like for you? Does, do your, does your family, your children, your sailor, whatever, do they know that you pray? When you speak, do you speak like, well, I think the Lord wants me to do this, right? This gives witness to a world that needs to know that there's something other than them, right? The center of their life. Ultimately, this invitation that the Lord has is an invitation, this relationship of prayer is to worship, to lead us to worship. We're going to pray for worship tonight. If you want to understand somebody, ask them what they worship, right? What do you work? Everybody worships something. Everybody worships something. If you want to understand what's important to a person, find out what they worship. What the Lord invites us in prayer is to be able to be quiet and to be able to still and encounter and worship him. Amen? Amen. This life of, the life of penance, I think, what the Lord is inviting us to. So, thoughts, comments, questions, reflections? Yeah. Would, well, I'm, I didn't get the last part. No, and I think that's what takes, that's, that's the process of metanoia, the process of conversion is that we don't merely do things 
out of an exercise, but it becomes how we are. It becomes our natural way of relating. I think that's why the, the, some, many people call Francis the mirror of Christ, that he became so conformed, so that he didn't think about things anymore. It was just the way he behaved and the way he acted. People. That's, that's the purpose of that, that it becomes habitual rather than merely an element that we add on to to exercise. Yeah, yeah, good. Other thoughts, comments, questions? Nope. Okay, uh, let's pray then. And I'll stick around and see if people have sense. So why don't we stand? And we'll go ahead and sing uh, the first verse of, of Come Holy Ghost. Come Holy Ghost, Creator blessed, and in our hearts take up thy rest. Come with thy grace and heavenly aid to fill the hearts which thou hast made. To fill the Thou Just invite you to quiet yourself for a moment and to allow yourself to be emptied. What is it that, that vies to be in the center of your heart right now? Fear, relationships, struggle with parents, sickness. So just for a moment, whatever that is, just recognize it and say, Jesus, I lay it before you. Lord, we pray that you would be our all, that you would be our everything that you would reveal to us those things that we make more important than you. The attitudes, the fear. Allow you to be our God and our all. Jesus, reveal to us those lepers in our life. Those people not like us. Those that don't understand. Those in their agendas. Whoever they are for us. Jesus, help us to look at other people the way you did. Because just with a glance, you changed hearts. And so oftentimes we look at people with disgust, with disdain, with judgment. Help us to see them as you did. Lord, root out sin in our life so that you might be glorified and that you would reign. Lord, that our life would produce fruits that, that other people recognize and they see that there's something different in us. That they recognize and see a fruit of joy and a fruit of peace. The fruit of your presence. Lord John the 23rd said, the surest sign of your presence is joy. Bring forth a fruit of joy. Lord, allow us to stop living for ourselves, but with, for others. Who are those people that you invite us to reach out to, to serve, to care for? Just take one moment, and what's the one word you take from this, meet, from this uh, afternoon? What is what, one word that the Lord is saying to you? One thing that you're going to hold on to. Lord, you invite us to live a life of metanoia, 
you invite us to penance, the first thing you say in the Gospels is, metanoia, repent, change, convert, turn. And I pray for the grace of this community to be able to respond to that. And that you bring forth life in our yes to you. Mother Mary, we ask for your intercession as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you guys. You got it the rest of the afternoon. Free dinner. I don't know what else is going on. Just go do something. God bless you guys.